Amen. I love the series that we're in right now, a current series on emotional health. And I just wrapped up a, a second master's degree, four years at Grand Canyon University uh, on, in professional counseling. And so I've just kind of gotten steeped in the behavioral science world, something new to me. I was theology, Bible, pastoral, but I always loved counseling. And so I went after that degree and just finished in May. All I can say is no more school for this guy for the rest of my stinking life, all right? I'm done with school. But having done that, obviously, I have a, a real affinity to the topic that Pastor Ryan, and I appreciate him being led by the Holy Spirit to say, you know, he felt something different, but then he felt God lay in his heart a few weeks ago to go a different direction, and this has been a fantastic series, hasn't it? And he's talked about, I'm so worried, right, and I'm so sad, and I'm so angry, and I'm so lonely, and next week will be that I'm so happy. It was supposed to be today, but how many of you know God didn't want Pastor Ryan happy today? He wanted happy next week, all right? But as I looked at this, and he called on Friday, I went back and began to work through a message from years ago on a topic that's so important for us. So I'm just labeling this, I'm so full of regret. Because regret is a noun, it's not an adjective, so I can't say I'm so regret. And how many of you know I'm full of it most of the time? So there you go, it comes together, all right? I'm so full of regret. Regret is a major thing in a lot of our lives. And I'm sure all of us here have small regrets that we carry. I had a, I had a small regret, kind of felt kind of big, but it really when I look back in retrospect and in light of world events right now, it was small. But I got in my truck on, I think it was like a Monday morning, and I thought, this, something doesn't quite smell right. It was rather aromatic that morning. And I'm thinking, what is that? And I called Carla and said, hey, it's kind of a sweet smell. Reminded me of buttered popcorn, you know? And that's not a favorite for me in my truck. I don't mind eating it, but smelling it, you know? And so the next morning I got in Tuesday morning, and I mean, it was like, it was buttered popcorn. You're like, what is going on? Real sweet, whatever smell. And so I, I got to the office downtown Phoenix. I work with pastors all week long and then get to come here to Generation Church on Sundays, which is so exciting. But I, I went in, and uh, when I got there, I forgot. I went on up into my office by then. How many of you know you acclimate to the ar aromatic moment, you know? So I didn't even think about it. Well, I went to lunch. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I got to see what is going on. My golf clubs are in the back seat of my truck, and so I went, and I'm, I'm kind of climbing through my truck sniffing, and all of a sudden, I came to the pocket, and I unzipped the pocket, and I came to my two canisters that I carry, and it was on Friday afternoon, teeing off at 3 o'clock, that I thought, well, I better bring a protein drink. Why don't we pull a chocolate protein drink and then let the cap fall off and four days later in Phoenix heat, bake all the way down my seat into the carpet behind the seat. How many of you have compassion for me right now? Okay, thank you. <laughs> It was disgusting. I worked on that baby. This morning I got in the truck. I rolled down the windows for a couple miles just to worship the Lord in the sunshine. You know, I'm a getting rid of this. Small regret. Every time I go to eat with Carla, my wife, love going out together. Every time that we do, if it's, if it's a restaurant we're used to, I have two things I eat. I know I like them, and, you know, I'm one of those guys. But if it's a new place, it never fails. 36 years of marriage. Every time, I'm like, well, what are you going to get? I don't know. What are you going to get? And then we divide, and she takes one, I take the other. I choose the poor dish. She chooses the perfect dish every stinking time. It's called a regret. I mean, you know, small regrets, right? You ever walked out of a theater and thought that was the biggest waste of money in my life? And now it's like 68 bucks for two of you. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. That was a stupid movie. Years ago, we met up friends of ours in Scottsdale, and they were kind of halfway, and we were old friends. So we met up, and we'd gotten together and, and gone to dinner and a movie just a couple weeks earlier, and then we went again. And, and that night as we walked out, I just said, that was the stupidest movie. I regretted any dropping, you know, then it was $2. But anyway, I regretted dropping it, you know. And he went to the restroom and came back. And while he was in there, we were saying, man, this was a really stupid movie. But that other movie was stupider, you know. And we were talking. He came out and we engaged. I'm like, I can't remember. What was the name of that movie two weeks ago? And he looked at us. He's like, Dumb and Dumber, <laughs> right? And we couldn't connect the dots, you know. We're sitting there talking. You ever been there? Now, these are small regrets, and they're really kind of silly regrets. How many of you regret believing when the Suns were up 2-0, we were going to win the NBA title? Let me see your hand this morning. Now, that's a bigger regret. That's almost getting big right there. All right. But today, I want to really take you to big regrets. 
because we all have them. We're, we live in a fallen world in Afghanistan right now. Oh, by the way, pray for Afghanistan. It's been a sickening week, hasn't it? But pray for those people. You know, Hebrews says to pray for those that are in prison for their faith and those that are suffering. Well, friends, we've got brothers and sisters suffering there. Pray for Haiti. We look at a world like this, it's crazy. And in all of our lives, because of a fallen world we live in, every one of us here has regrets. It just comes with it. Big time regrets. They usually fall in two categories. The things we should have done and the things we shouldn't have done. Those things we wish we would have done and the regret we have of ever doing some things. After pastoring for 37 years and lead pastoring for about 20 of those years, I've sat with countless people. And so often the reason, the cause of their pain, their frustration, their whatever it is, it goes back to regret. They're still carrying something from years ago. And, 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 and if anything, I've learned regret to be one of the most negative, emotional, energy kind of things in us. Right along with worry and sadness and loneliness, I'm telling you, regret is a major thing, especially the older we get. One woman wrote, regret seems to take hold of the heart in a way that other states and emotions do not. Many other emotional states, however, much power they may hold for a time, they're dynamic. That is to say, most of us will recover from them, even if we don't want to, and even if it's only to get into a state of numbness, we will overcome. But regret's power, however, is in its sense one of permanence. It's true for a lot of people. I've always had little issues with regret my whole life, as I'm sure you have, but a few years ago, about five years ago, I had major regret, and I have a dear wife that always balances me so well, and Carla, she just, she's like the Teflon woman. Doesn't matter what hits her, she can just let it go, but for me, I'm just absorbing it and living in it, and so many times she'd say, honey, you got to let it go, you got to let that go, and I would just live in that. Any of you ever been there? Webster's defines regret, the opening definition, first word, is sorrow. See, because regret is, it carries an element of loss to it. It's usually over a loss of control because now the deed is done. We can't go back. It's kind of an I coulda, woulda, shoulda kind of a thing. One man said, I think this is just powerful. Most of us crucify ourselves between two thieves, regret for the past and fear for the future. We crucify ourselves. It's so true. Pastor Ryan did a phenomenal job talking about the future a few weeks ago, talking about worry and how unpacking the way worry can just drain us. And it's things we cannot control, but we live in that, that fear of the future, that worry. But many times as well, equally so, we hang on to the past and we literally nail ourselves to the cross that we make for ourselves of things that we did, things that have been done to us, regret. Here's the bottom line. If we spend our time with regrets over yesterday and worries over what might happen tomorrow, we will have nothing left for our today. Philippians 3, I think, is a great example. Many. Oh, matter of fact, I was thinking about it yesterday. How many different characters that I could turn to in the Bible? The Bible's full of regret. But I thought about Philippians 3. The word's not used there, but there's something here that I think is critical for us understanding. And it helps us with a template of how to overcome regret. Pick it up, verse number 4, if you have your phone or handheld there on the screen. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Say, well, I don't hear a lot of regret there. There's not. And this is from a man who literally, almost more than any other man, significantly altered world history, much less your history, if you're in a church today and you believe in Jesus. And there's a spirit to Paul's words here that I really want us to capture today. Paul basically opens up boasting. He is the ultimate church kid or synagogue kid. Okay. He's the ultimate. He, his spiritual pedigree as a learned Jewish rabbi in that day, he is zealous for the law and, and well-educated. He even makes the claim, think about it, he says, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. That's like saying, I am an American of all the Americans. 
That's a huge statement. And Paul, the zeal. He had been raised a lineage of God's chosen people, Israel, that would bring Jesus to earth. His whole life was marked by a devout devotion to his faith. Then we come to that little word, and always note it in Scripture, the word but. Verse 7, but, he says, and here comes a turn. But whatever was for my profit, I now consider or count it loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. All of that boasting, everything in his past that he says is amazing and good and I can be proud of that. He says, I count it loss in that now I have found a new passion and his name is Jesus. Reminds me of last Sunday, and I got to meet Julie later. I think I'd met her maybe one time, but a little bit more Sunday night. But we talked about Julie. Julie, There are Julies all over this church, and I love that. People that have come to know Jesus at Generation Church. Isn't that exciting? And that new passion for Paul, he says, that is, it outdoes anything. I'm letting it all go. He even uses a word there that all of his religious training, all of his spiritual pedigree, all of that, he says, it is literally in the Greek, it is dung. It's excrement. There'd be other English words we could come up with for the Greek here. That's what he says. All of it, it's a pile. You got it. And in sharing the life passion, Paul makes it very clear that he hadn't arrived yet, that there's so much more he is striving for because now he knows Jesus, but hear him, he wants to know Jesus even more. And could I say, I've been raised a pastor's kid, talking to my parents recently about it, I sensed a call on my life to be a pastor when I was a little boy, but all I can say is this, you never outknow Jesus. I kind of remember oh, Pastor Ryan, not long, talked about bow nose, but let me tell you, you'll never fully know Jesus. Because he's just, he's like a diamond. And you get him from one angle, you get to know him. And then you find, oh, there's another whole angle to know Jesus even better. Paul says, I want to know Christ, verse 10. This is Paul. You know Jesus. Oh, no. I want to know Christ. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this, all of this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Amazing spiritual desire. He wants to know Jesus better. Then comes the important thing for this morning. Verse 13 and 14. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Housed within those words and this whole text, I believe, are more than just passionate words. It's more than just a passion, but there's also their words of regret. Say, where? I didn't see it. Forgetting what is behind. Forgetting what's behind. If you deal with regret, this will be the hinge pin for your victory. You have to come to a point sooner or later in your life, whatever it is that you're getting beat up, you beat yourself up, you crucify yourself on it, you will have to let go of that nail of regret in order to walk free in what Jesus has for you. And what was behind Paul that he had to, he had to, forget. It wasn't only his Jewish pedigree. It wasn't only what he's talked about here. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 9, he eloquently lays it all out again. He's proud to be Jewish. He is proud to be part of Israel. He's proud of the citizenship that he had in this earth because through it came Jesus Christ to earth. But he lists a whole bunch of things in Romans 9 leading all the way to Christ's coming. Paul is proud of his, his, uh, his lineage in, in Jewish lineage. And, and there's a reason for that. And, and hear me, it's almost like a spiritual pride Because everything God did came through the Old Testament to the New Covenant, came through Israel to give us Jesus. And so we love Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why we read the Old Testament. But we know it gave us us Jesus. 
So he's proud of that. He's, he has some regret for that. He is saying all of that and the pride that he would have. Yet all of that, what was, it was for his profit, he now says is lost. And he goes even further and says, I count everything loss compared to knowing Jesus. How's within Paul were no doubt regrets, regrets for sins that he had committed. No doubt regrets for some of that misplaced zeal and the law, the law of Moses, everything. You hear that, you sense it. But beyond that, if you know the rest of the New Testament and you read Paul's early story in the book of Acts and then words like this, 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Aren't you thankful for that? Of whom he says, I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience. That's kind of weird. He's a religious guy. I mean, if you've lived a religious life that much, you're the worst. I mean, there's a lot of sinners out there. You're the worst. He says it twice. In me, the worst of sinners, Christ, his, uh, he might be displayed unlimited patience. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. For I am the least of the apostles. How many know Paul needs a self-image issue here? I mean, we got a problem going on. I'm the worst. I'm the least. Why? He says, for I'm the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Ah, I get it now, Paul. See, early when he's listing all those things about his Jewish pedigree, I kind of blew right by it. Did you catch it? Verse 6, as for zeal, persecuting the church. See, when Paul, his name was Saul, as you read in the book of Acts, chapter 8, the first martyrdom that we read of, and there were countless and thousands upon thousands, but it began with Stephen. And it says when Stephen was martyred, and you can picture it, you know, and they still do it today in some Arab countries. Can you imagine stones being thrown and you just, you're pelted with stones until you just fall under the weight, one hits you just right, finally takes you out. Can you imagine what a gruesome way to die? And and Stephen was stoned to death, very common in that day. And it says they took his clothes and they laid them at the feet of a man named Saul. And Saul gave approval for his death. Goes on to say they were dragging women and children out of homes. What's happening right now in Afghanistan? It was happening. Saul was behind it in that day. Saul sanctioned that. So you have this man that God has used in this amazing way. He's he's the great apostle that he is. But for him, looking back, as for zeal, I persecuted the church. As for being an apostle, I'm the least. I shouldn't even be called an apostle Because I persecuted the church. When it comes that Jesus died for sinners, I am the worst. Regret. Let's set Paul aside just for a moment. Regret's a very real part of life. And if you live any length of time, you'll have things you're going to regret. Again, Webster's defines it. It's sorrow aroused by circumstances beyond one's control. Or beyond your power to repair. You ever wanted to go back to high school and do something different than what you did? You ever wanted to go back to your childhood or back to your early adult life or back something as a, as a husband or a father or try, whatever, any jobs, things you just wish you could just repair? Could I just go back? You know what the amazing thing is about God is that God has regrets. Isn't that interesting? Matter of fact, Pastor Ryan, week one, did such a good job reminding us the reason we emote and not always good emotions is because we're made in the image of God. He took us to Genesis, and we read about being created in the very workmanship of God, and that's why we emote. That's why at times we have sorrow, even when we look at regrets. 1 Samuel 15, God grieved. He had made Saul the king of Israel. The New American Standard Bible says regretted that he made Saul king. The Hebrew word there means to be sorry, to console yourself. You ever consoled yourself? To regret, to repent. 
Way back in Genesis chapter 6, it's a different Hebrew word, but it means the same. It says that God looked at the wickedness of the earth and he said, this is crazy. Mankind have turned their back on me. All of their inclination is only evil. And it says the same thing again, that he grieved and it even carries with it a measure of hurt. He was hurting inside because of man's sin. Verse 6 it reads, and the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved at heart. So even God knows what it is to feel regret. Parents, if you parent, you're going to have regrets. Not regrets for what they do, regrets for what you do. I've got three wonderful married daughters and our seventh grandbaby on the way, and I love my girls. They're awesome, and they're just, they're, they're just perfect. Well, they're not perfect, but you know what I'm saying. I'm a dad. Now, the grandkids are perfect. They're flawless. I haven't even seen a sinful nature yet in any of it. It's amazing. They're just incredible. But you love your kids. You know, and Carly used to say, Jeff, if we can just get them where they love God and love us, that'll be it. And you know, we arrive there. Praise God. We're a success, I think. I, I'm, I'm applauding for me, not, not whatever. <laughs> but I rejoice in that. But you know, I look back, I've got all kinds of regrets. And I'll say it to them now. And they're like, Dad, oh, Dad, let, let that go. But some of the ministry decisions and the way I did things, and I was church, it was life, that was my life. And, and you, know, you live with those regrets. Aren't you thankful that God has the same? Isn't that comforting to think God regrets over his kids? And so we as parents, we're going to have our regrets. So what do we do with regret? How do we handle it so that it doesn't just cripple us? I think returning here to Paul helps us because now we can see in that one phrase and a couple phrases to understand where he's at and how we overcame it. So I'm going to give you three things today. And if I'm in a good mood, we'll go to five or six. But let's start with three. All right. The first one is this, to rest in God's grace. Rest in God's grace. I mean, I mean, really, think about it. What else is there? When we know that we've done something that's so bad, to know that God's grace is there. And to think about Paul, he has gone in this text from being a spiritual giant in one sense, all the way down to being the worst of sinners And now becoming the incredible apostle that he was. No wonder Paul often spoke about God's grace in his life. And we even see it here. There's three three aspects of it. One is a converting grace. What we talked about last week with Julie. What's so exciting. And, And he says it this way. For Christ Jesus took hold of me. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. What incredible picture. It's not just Paul pursuing Christ, but it's Christ pursuing him. The word there means to apprehend, to take hold of, to seize. So Paul is saying, I am trying to seize some things as a result of Jesus seizing me. See, in our faith, there is definitely an aspect of choice in being a Christian. There's an aspect where you choose to love God. You choose to follow Jesus. You choose. That's why we talk a lot about free will and that we're free moral agents. We choose. But hear me. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And so there's an element that as we come to choose him, we realize we're really responding to him choosing us. Isn't that awesome? And that's, so, that's just so comforting for me today. Remember, Paul had one of the craziest conversions in the whole Bible. I mean, he literally got knocked off his high horse. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, remember? And some of you may have a life like that. And you think back, when you came to Jesus, it was such a radical thing. You know what I've seen through the years? So often, it will be at a person's lowest point in their life that they'll come to Jesus. Seldom will it be when they're on the mountaintop, but a lot of times when it's in the valley, because in those moments, God is just working extra in to draw you and to bring you, to seize you, and so you in turn choose to seize him. As well, there's a continuing grace mentioned here. He says, not that I have already obtained all of this. See, leaving that horse that day, and you watch the journey of Paul, Paul's amazing path of his life, but in all of it, you sense in Paul, he's still growing, he's still continuing, here he is even here to say, I want to know Christ, I'm like, come on, Paul, you do know him, but he's saying, I want to know him more, there's a continuing grace for Paul, same is true for each one of us today, our sins are forgiven, knowing our past is the past. It's just the beginning of a lifetime, day by day, to walk with Jesus. And we're all in 
process, and I love that. Matter of fact, that's what to me makes life groups so awesome. You get together with a small group of people, you know what? We're all in process in this group. That's what I love about coming together for worship like this, and I, I so value Pastor Aaron and his team. I love the worship leading here, and to worship God, I just enjoy it so much. But you know what? All of us here, we come through these doors, we leave out those doors, but we all, in Christ, we're all being perfected even now. It's a continual work of grace in our lives. But there's still a completing grace that he mentions here. Because Paul opens it this way in Philippians 1, being confident of this one thing. Here's a fact. He that began a good work in you is going to carry it all the way to completion until the day of Jesus Christ, when Jesus comes back one day. So there's a completing. God here, he says, has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Hear me, friends. Till we're there, it isn't done. Heaven is our home. Heaven is our citizenship. Some of us forget all about that, and we put that so far, but not Paul. He said, that's my focus. That that is the completion of God's grace in me is when I get to heaven. A lot of us don't want to go there today, but we want to get there someday, right? And that's the whole point of our faith. So that's our God's grace in our lives. Rest in that. If you live with a lot of regrets until you embrace the grace of God and rest in it, you're going to have regrets. Paul helped us with that. Second, he helped us to do this. Number two, reduce it all to nothing. In response to regret, reduce it all to nothing. What do I mean? Look back again, verse 7. For whatever was to my profit, the great things, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing knowledge of, of knowing Christ Jesus. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them dung, rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Such important words. Words some people never come to a point of truly confessing and living out. They may want Jesus, but also they want to hang on to everything else. But see, Paul said he was grasping Christ. I'm taking hold of Jesus here. It meant letting go of a lot of things, losing a lot of things. Most of us here would say, especially when it comes to the regrets of our lives, oh yeah, I, I want to get rid of that. And we see it. But Paul here begins with the highs and the lows and everything in between. That's why I think we can look to the great theologian, Clint Eastwood, for a little help here. <laughs> but we need to let, good, let go of the good and the bad and the ugly. Amen. When it comes to following Jesus, that's what Paul does here. The good, the trophies, all the good things I do, but I work and I'm on the team. Tomorrow night we'll celebrate the team and and I'm doing and I'm doing and I'm doing and all of that. But still, when it comes to Jesus, let it go. Let it become lost because I just want Jesus. The bad, all your sins, all your mistakes, all those things you look back and think, oh, what was I thinking when I did that? Letting it go because you've got Jesus. Thankfully, that's one, one of the great principles that Paul gave us, by the way, Romans 6. Because where sin is, there's grace. And his thing is, no matter how great the sin, there's even greater grace. Isn't that awesome? That's why times in our lives, amen. At times in our lives, we look at certain people, serial killers. I mean, craziness out there. And then we have to realize the blood of Jesus is good enough for anyone anyone. Isn't that amazing? So once in a while, we'll hear about a great conversion, someone that came to Christ and go, well, I don't know. Why? Because it was so bad. Seriously? We're talking about God and His perfect plan of redemption to give God's Son, who is God in flesh, to lay His life down for you. You don't think that's good enough for that person? Sadly, I've had many people say to me as a pastor, you don't know what I've done. And I always would say, are you telling me God's not good enough for you? Jesus isn't good enough for you. So see, all of it, Paul said, buried like dung because of of Jesus. And there are the uglies. You know what the uglies are? The uglies are those shoulda, coulda, wouldas, those little regrets, and they just nag at you, and oh, I wish, and oh, I wish, and let it go, because you've got Jesus. Hold on to Jesus. Paul said it this way, forgetting what is behind and straining then for what is ahead. Consider it all lost. Consider it rubbish. That is the key. Now, some people think just running 
we'll keep, you know, we'll let them escape from the repercussions of things that they've done. Well, not true. Galatians 6 says, don't be deceived. You can't mock God. A man reaps what he sows. Now, we may be forgiven under the blood of Jesus, but you know what? Sometimes we're going to have to live with some of the repercussions of decisions we've made. But hear me, it's one thing for that. It's another thing to live and wallow in them. It's another thing that you can't move past them. And so you just kind of let regret chew you up where you lose today and you certainly lose tomorrow in God because of regret. All of those things. All of those things, Paul said, I count it all loss compared to knowing Jesus. But one thing I do, he said, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So rest in his grace. Reduce it all to nothing. Number three, replace your regrets with vision. This is huge. It's a strange fact about life, but what's lived is lived. The words you spoke, and they can be painful words, they can be powerful words, and you go, oh, I wish I wouldn't have said that, and, you know, and those words, and they do shoot out like arrows, and you can't regather them. That is so painful sometimes, and oh, sometimes I get the gift from my mother. It's like a genetic thing with us. She just sometimes, oh, mom, I can't believe you said that, and here I am doing the same thing. It's a spiritual gift. Somewhere in the Bible, I don't know where it's at, but we got to work on it. But words we speak, choices we make. Friends, choices you make, they're done. You can't go back. You can't change them. You can somehow try to fix them with another choice, but still the choice is made. And once it's made, they're made. But notice for Paul what he says to do. Three things. Forget what's behind. Focus on what's ahead. It's something we all have to do. Since regret, much like worry, does absolutely nothing to change where you're at. Let me say that again. Since regret, much like worry, doesn't do you any good at all. If anything, it's detrimental to you. If just in the same way as Pastor Ryan said, we worry about the, it doesn't matter. It does no good for us until we get there and live that. Why do you worry about that in the same way it does you no good to wallow in something from the past? you got to let it go. Four years ago, I sat with a counselor coach, incredible ministry here in Mesa. For 20 years, he'd worked with leaders. He was kind of near retirement, writing his final book, written, authored many books. And I sat with him, and he just wonderful help. But he said, you know, Jeff, I, I, I've watched a cycle, and it was going to be in his final book. He said, a cycle in people's lives. And you could just write at the top of it, regret. It was something else, but, but just a very uh, commonality between the two. And so it was, it was a cycle of four things, four steps, and he walked me through them. And, and the third one and fourth one, interesting, when you're battling regret in your life, choices you've made, decisions you've made, life-altering things, the third one was, I want you to sit down and write a list. And I got on my laptop, and I mean, I, I, I made that list, and it kept growing. He said, I want you to work through this with God. Just get with God alone and pray and seek Him and to work through things you have to let go of as a result of that decision. So I had a lot of things I had to let go of. Let go, let go, just let it go. And then the fourth thing as you came on around was to dream again. And that's at the end of the cycle. And when he got there, it's like something inside of me erupted. My eyes just squirted. And it was just, I didn't even know that was in me. But I realized I wasn't dreaming anymore. My dream had died. It had died through some choices. It had died through some things people did to me. It had died through a lot, of, and I realized I'm not dreaming. That's it, I'm not dreaming. Hear me, replace your regret with what God has for you to do in the future. Recreate, let, let it go. Let it go, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, those regrets. I'll close with this. 29 years ago, Carl and I came to East Mesa to pastor a church. And uh, as I was leaving, I was at Dream City Church all through my 20s, so eight and a half years up there out of Bible college. And so I was 30 years of age, coming over to be the lead pastor for the first time in my life. But in leaving Dream City Church, a man named Alvin, Pastor Alvin, invited me to his house, and, and he was kind of urgent about it. So I went, and, and the Boers, B-O-O-H-E-R, the Boers were on staff there for years, and now they've, they've been gone a long time. But they were probably in their mid to late 80s, and it was just the, it was the sweetest little encounter. It was amazing. But they wanted me to come by. 
And he gave, he gave me some gifts, and one of them was a, a light blue sweater I will never wear on earth. But it was the sweetest thing when he gave it to me, you know. And he really wanted me to have this sweater. I'm, thank you, Pastor. Well, we called them then brother and sister. Thank you, Brother Boer. And, and he had all, you know, a few different things and books that I wanted and whatever. And so it was, it was just a very nice thing. But then he sat me down. And he, and he, and he said, I just want to tell you a story. Something I never knew. I knew him for eight and a half years. I never knew this. He pulled out what I would call a violin. He called it his fiddle. And he said, here's my fiddle. And, and he didn't get tears in his eyes. And he said... I played this fiddle in more bars all across the Southwest. And he went into his testimony, a story about coming to Jesus. I never knew this. I mean, he's a pastor. He, his, his pastor ministry was visitation. He was amazing. He went hospital to hospital. Literally one year, he prayed with over 3,000 people to receive Jesus in a single year. I didn't even know how you do that, but he could do it. The guy was like Superman. And he was 78 years old in that day. Wonderful man. But with tears, he said, Jeff, I wasted so many years of my life. And he said, I always look at this fiddle as a reminder of what I'm letting go of. He said, that's why you never heard my story. He said, I didn't become a follower of Jesus. I think he was in his early 50s or 60s when he became a Christian. I knew him as Pastor Alvin. Everybody respect. He was amazing what he did, his craft of ministry. But his point was, Jeff, I have so many regrets But he said he put it down and he closed the lid and he said, but I've chosen to set that aside because I'm serving Jesus. And he was still in full-time ministry in his mid-80s. That's a man who said, I know how to deal with regret. But you know what? Once in a while, he'd open up the case just to remember what Jesus had done for him. So you know what? If you've got some fiddles in your life today, I'd encourage you once in a while, sure, Pull it out from under the bed, open it up, and just look at it for a second. Don't get carried away. Don't play a song on it. Just pull it out, look at it, slide it under the bed. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, God. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning? And as we do... I bet you earlier when I just mentioned regret, maybe some already. You just went there. That's what I can do so easily. And maybe for you, there's a regret. Right now, it it burns in your soul. Why don't you just give that to God today? Why don't you choose like Paul? Let it go. Forgetting what's behind, straining toward what is ahead. Press on to heaven. Press on to what God has for you. Maybe you're here today and you say, Jeff, you wouldn't believe. You're one of those that says to me, you know, you don't know what I've done. It's almost like you're doubting the power of Jesus. Listen, if God had a plan and he perfectly brought it to fruition in history by bringing his perfect son to die on the cross for sins of humanity, it's good enough for you today. So please don't allow your sense of weight of regret and guilt to overcome Jesus. Let Jesus overcome your guilt. Let the cross work in your life. So I want to invite you today. You say, I'm filled with regret. Jeff, my past, could I encourage you today to come to Jesus and offer him your sin. Offer him your past. Offer him everything you've done. I don't care. Let the list be a mile long. It doesn't matter. The cross of Jesus can completely eradicate Every sin you've ever committed. But also there, and I'm going to include you in this prayer, there are believers here. You say, I love Jesus, and I'm following Jesus, but you are still beating yourself up, crucifying yourself with the nail of regret. And as we pray, I'm going to ask you, why don't we say today is the day I'm going to quit living in the past, and I'm going to embrace today and the future that God has for me. How about today be the day? Would you pray with me if that's you? In either case, would you pray with me right now? Heavenly Father, thank you that you made me as an emotional person. You allow me, God, all the emotions that you have, God. Thank you for creating me. And this Sunday, God, 22nd of August, 2021, I'm asking you, God, to step into my world. Forgive me of my sins. 
Forgive me of everything I regret. Forgive me of all those choices I've made, things I've said, things I've done. God, I I give it to you right now, and I say, I believe in Jesus. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I need him, and I ask you to come into my heart and my life and my mind and to change me. And God, as well, I leave my regrets from the past. I leave them with you, Jesus. And I want to just put my eyes on you and focus above them and beyond them and follow you for the rest of my life. Please come into my heart, forgive me of my sins now, and set me free of that that holds me back for you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen, amen, amen.